The reviews are in, and we're going to tell you what they are. He's Todd Vandenberg. I'm Rob Steele, and we've got stuff. We've even got a new segment that we came up with, what, half an hour ago. Woo! Because, you know, yeah. we work on the fly like that. Which, uh, if you hear some funny banging noises during the show, that's me trying to kill the fly that snuck into the studio with me. Hmm. Fun. Evil. Uh, speaking of killing, killing bugs and things that look like bugs, even if they're really, really big bugs. Indeed. You, you have a movie where they did that this week. I do have a movie where they did this, that, 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 blah, where they did that this week. You should leave that in because that's very awesome. Yes, I'm going to talk about a movie that came out a while ago and surprisingly underperformed at the box office. And it was, it was, it was it still this year. year. It was yeah. totally this year. It was just a few months ago. Uh, came out the end of May. Woo! It was not a huge Memorial Day hit that they had hoped to be. But I'm talking about Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Now, Godzilla is one of my favorite movie characters of all time. Actually, when I still live in Tennessee, packed up the family, drove down to Atlanta because they were having a screening of the original 1954 version of Godzilla in Japanese. So oh. that was why we went down, which was awesome. Uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, improves in one aspect of the 2015 version of Godzilla, the first American version, which is actually good, not the horrible 98 version, which was terrible, because there's more monsters in it, more monster fights. That's what everybody wanted. I remember when that came out, that was your major complaint about it, Rob, is that where's Godzilla, which... Actually, my, my complaint was, uh, to be honest, a little bit more of, can we turn on some lights so we can see the bastard? <laughs> there, was a, there were a lot of night battles. That's, that's true. J just a few, yes. Like and everyone almost. used infrared lighting so they could see what was going on. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're on the other end of the screen going, did they film anything? I hear sounds. Well, anyway, the, good, the, the good news is they resolved that problem because this is chock full of monster fights, which are, which are really well done. Um, the effects look great. They look about as real as you could imagine monsters like this to look. Uh, it's full of all the great, the pantheon of the old characters. And they added some new, but yes, King Gidor is in here. Mothra is in here. Rodan is in here. So, hey, the gang, the band is back together. Uh, and I enjoyed it. It was fun. But as you can hear from the tone of my voice, there there's a problem with it. They somehow gave more personality and character to the monsters than they did to the humans. Mm. Now, granted, the people in a Godzilla movie are always going to be the backstory. But they're the part that links the fight scenes together so that you aren't bored and almost fall asleep while you're waiting for the next monster fight. Uh, it's hard to remember a movie that has this much acting talent that doesn't show up on the screen. They made a huge deal about Millie Bobby Brown, breakout star of Stranger Things. Every single trailer had her in it. They could have put a cardboard cutout of Millie Bobby Brown or any actress in this movie. And it's not that she's bad. She has nothing to do. And that's the problem with every single actor. Vera Farmiga, fantastic actress. Could have been anybody, anybody on the planet. Uh, the reason for this is the director, Michael Doherty. Uh, let's see. There's a famous writer, director by the name of George Lucas, who famously, for whatever reason, later in his career, had a hard time getting performances from actual people, like witness <clears throat> the atrocities that are known as the prequel Star Wars films. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're Oscar winners in those movies. And again, they look like cardboard cutouts because he's terrible at this. Dory apparently went to the George Lucas School of Direction because he gets nothing from these. Another part of the reason is the screenplay. Guess who wrote the screenplay? Yay, Michael Doherty. Uh, how he got the gig is beyond me. Here are some of the things that are on his credits. He starts out with X2, X-Men United. Yay, good job. Uh, Superman Returns, mm, not so good. Like 10 million versions of Trick or Treat? Mm -mm. Krampus? Mm -mm. Oh, guess what? X-Men Apocalypse. 
which a lot of people consider to be what, Rob? The best or Al the worst? Alpaca lips? No, I didn't particularly care for it. No. How did this guy get this gig? I, unbelievable. I just don't understand it. He also directed Trick or Treat. Yay, and Krampus. Not, Why? Not, not known for being the best movies. Why would you turn over what you hope is a billion dollar franchise to a guy with this track record and think you're going to get something good out of it? Uh, yeah. And again, I actually do recommend the film. I know it doesn't sound like it, but take your Kindle or, well, you know, can't, don't have to take anything because it's not at the movies anymore because, again, horrible underperforming film. But it, this is a good movie to watch like while you're cooking. And I'm sure there's an app out there where you can cue it for, oh, monsters are coming up. So you can come back in from making whatever you're making or, I don't know, knitting a sweater or something. And you can put that down when the monsters come on because that part's really good, very entertaining, very well done. But the moment you see a human face, just zone out until you see something dark green or gold show up. Then you'll be happy. I just... <laughs> And again, I like the movie. I know it sounds like I hated it. I didn't. But this could have been at least a really good movie instead of, well, I like this part of it, but man, the rest of it sucked. Because the rest of it, if there's not a monster on the screen, this movie's awful. Thankfully, the monsters are on screen a lot. That's the, and of course, that's the idea. But how anybody looked at any of the dailies from this or how anybody looked at the script and thought, oh, this is good. Totally beyond me. Totally beyond me. It, to it belongs in the DC universe because, wow. Ouch. Such an uneven mix. Uh, and the sad news is he also wrote Godzilla vs. Kong, which is the sequel coming up. So, yike. Um, happily, he's not the director, though. So, there's hope. There there's always hope. There is. She's always in the other movie that you chose not to watch this week. <clears throat> <laughs> Just saying. Um, actually, this is something that I, I have gotten. I, I've got the DVD of it. Have I watched it yet? No. Uh, because there's, you know, I have kids who have lives and they insist on me driving them around to those lives. So you fool. Silly me. Putting the kids first. What was I thinking? I did, however, make my kids sit down and watch the movie I watched this week. Because I, I'll be honest, I don't know if it came out in a theater. I do know it's available for streaming, and I think there's a DVD version. I I did stream this, and I, I'm not sure I can recommend it highly enough, uh, especially to Trek fans. Because uh -huh. uh, I mentioned this last week, I, I was going to review something that we left behind and. That's actually the name of the movie. Actually, it's a documentary called What We Left Behind. Uh, it's about Star Trek's Deep Space Nine series, which I think was the most horribly underrated of the Star Trek series. Um, I think it was better than Next Generation. I think it was better than the original series, even. Th this is my favorite Trek series because it, it wasn't episodic as such. Because, I mean, the other Trek series, you can come in at any point and go, oh, here's what's going on. You don't have to worry about, well, when did that happen? Oh, that happened last week? I missed the episode. Star Trek, you had to watch every week, which I thought was a, I think it's a great idea. I think if it had come out when uh, binge watching was a thing, which it is now, wasn't then. We didn't really have the internet back then. AOL could not have handled it. <laughs> um. It would have been much better. And you can you can binge watch it now. And I highly recommend doing that and watching this documentary, which had a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Um, I think all the actors who are still with us got to be in this to some extent. Even minor characters came in and said, hey, here's what we did with this part. And I love doing this. And I mean, some of the background stories are great. Uh, the stories about how they put everything together were great. Um, seeing the characters on the screen again was really cool. Um, and finding out 
finding out some of the things they wanted to do. Like if you're not familiar with with the storyline, it takes place basically around the planet Bajor, which was recently um, recently threw off the Cardassians who had, been, had basically enslaved the entire planet for 60-something years. And one of the main characters, Major Kira Norris, um, is a Bajoran who's on the space station Deep Space Nine. And they had mentioned in this, uh, in, in what we leave behind, that they wanted to give her a Cardassian love interest just to throw a plot twist in. And the way Nana Visitor talked about it, she's the actress who played Major Kira, said, I had heard that they wanted to do a Cardassian love interest for my character, but for God's sake, don't make me do it with Mark Alamo. I'm sorry, I mean Gul Dukat, his character. And there was this big thing about how it, it, it you just got this feeling that no one wanted Mark Alamo, the, the guy who played the overarching big bad of all seven seasons, mm-hmm. uh, to even be on the set of this documentary. It was just at the... You, I couldn't really tell if it was an uh, just a running gag or not, but it was funny as hell. Um, a beautiful little scene. One of the other things that I think was a highlight of this that also ends up being a, a, a foreshadowed low light, and it's kind of creepy in a sense, um, is they talk about if they could do a season eight of the show starting now, you know, 20 something years later, um, and one of the things it focused on in the f- opening scene was uh, the character of Nog, who has been through all seven seasons. He started out as uh, he's a Ferengi. He's a little he was a little brat kid uh, who would go, he would go around and steal things from other places on the station. He would get other characters in trouble. He was just kind of a little pain in the ass kid. But we got to see him grow through all seven seasons to the point where he ended up being the first Ferengi in Starfleet. He ended up being the helmsman of the Defiant, which is the ship assigned to Deep Space Nine. So, Which is uh, a very cool design, too, that it, ship. It was. Um, but he also became such a, a big character and such a big thing. He, When they had the Dominion War, he lost a leg, um, which is something you never see in, in Star Trek of characters... You know, losing a limb right. and having to go through what you have to go through for that and post-traumatic stress. And there was a few episodes that dealt with that, which were really good and made Nog a very interesting and very tangible character and stuff. Um, and one of the first things they did in, in their fictional season eight, Nog is now the captain of the Defiant which comes back from the Delta Quadrant through the wormhole. If you don't know what that means, watch the show. It'll make sense. I'm not going to explain the whole thing to you. The Defiant comes back in. Nog says something through a garbled communication, and the ship blows up, killing everyone on it, including Nog. How's that for a a way to bring you back into the series? Oh, my God, what the hell just happened? Um, Which I thought would be really cool. Until last weekend, when I found out that Aaron Eisenberg, who played Nog, actually did die of kidney failure, ah. which is sad and traumatic and, you know, thoughts and prayers. I'm not going to send thoughts and prayers. Those are useless. But, you know, sympathies and everything to the Eisenberg family and the Star Trek family and all that stuff. Um, and also, apparently, to their opening for season eight, which I wanted to see, but I guess we're not going to. Um, anyway, what mm-hmm. we leave behind a magnificent thing that uh, yes, there are blo- there's kind of a blooper reel scattered throughout. It's very much worth seeing. It's I want to say it's on Amazon Prime at the moment, um, and a few other places. Then you should great. say it. Go see it, or actually stay home and see it. <laughs> yeah, if you get the opportunity to go, go see it somewhere. You know, do that as well. But. I I, I want to throw in. I'm not a big a, as big a fan of D Space Nine as you are. I mean, I've, I haven't seen the whole the entire run. I really like what I've seen. It just, it's one of those things I'll get to it. But one note about this, about the documentary, this is from the executive producer of the series, yeah. which to me, that's a big difference because we've seen lots of documentaries on, on shows and most of them are really well done and they're really good, but they're usually by fans who came at it from the outside, which is a cool perspective, no doubt. But this is, this is the person who was there for, He's he did. Got the, he narrated he has, it. He, he's he got, a main character in it. He has all the threads. 
Yeah. I mean, if anybody is this show, it's this guy, Iris Stephen Bear. So another big read to me, this has me interested in watching the documentary before I even finish watching the entire series. This is a really cool inside look at it. And his literal blue beard. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Just watch it just for the beard so you can go, holy crap, that is blue. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is very cool. I, I, I really enjoyed the series and I enjoyed the documentary and highly recommend both. Um, and I'm trying to figure out which segment we should go with next. Did, did we want to go to the news? Because I think there was really only one big news story this week and I'm kind of disappointed by it. Are you? Well, since I you am. mentioned it, let's, um, let's go with it. The, the, the reason I'm disappointed it's because I was hoping we could get through an entire show without having to mention Marvel or Disney. <laughs> and we can't do it. Um, for those of you who did not know that Sony took Spider-Man back from Marvel and said, no, we're making our own movies. You can't have them anymore. Uh, that changed their mind. Spider-Man's back. That's the big news of the week. To me, the big news, and that is the big news, obviously. And when I first saw it, I thought, Mm, no, I want to see this on like eight other sites and something that's not just a blog, like someone like us saying, oh, look, this is back. It's like, ah, uh, sure. Because it just seemed so incredible because it seemed like. Well, as much oh, of a big deal as they made out of it. And it was a big deal. The fact that it, it was done because obviously yeah. it really worked for both companies. Um, as it turns out, to the leaders of the two different studios, Amy Pascal, Sony, and Mr. Feige, Marvel, they got together because they've been friends for about 20 years at least, and they hashed out the details. And then they went to their respective bosses because, yes, even bosses have bosses. They went to, like, the boards, I'm sure, and said, listen, this is really stupid. We figured out how to make this work. So the deal is originally what Disney had proposed was 50% of the cost Versus 50% of the profits. Seems reasonable. Sony didn't like it. Feige and Pascal came back with 25% of the cost, 25% of the profits. Everybody's happy. It, 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 seems like, it seems like the bean counters could have made that happen pretty easily. For whatever reason, they didn't. Uh, so all credit to them for making this work. And a lot of credit, honestly, to the fans. Because I'm sure, I think the uproar had a lot to do with this not not the perceived backlash and boycotts because come on you know how many people were really going to boycott the next spider-man movie 10 or 12 no one was going to boycott it but just the unhappiness about it let them know that wow this really was a big deal as if they couldn't tell that <clears throat> you know a few billion dollars here and there didn't point to that people were happy about this so all credit to pascal and feige they're the ones who made this actually happen so Again, people who actually care about what people want as opposed to assembling something like <clears throat> Godzilla versus and King of the Monsters and going by the numbers and trying to think of what's going to work. Nice I'm job on actually working and thinking about what this looks like on the screen instead of how much money are we going to make. And certainly that was part of the issue too, but... Fan service, ultimate fan service. Oh, let's fix this. So very, very cool. I think some of the this hoopla around the story was, <clears throat> we don't have another Marvel movie coming out until March. How do we stay in the news? <laughs> I Could honestly be. think that was some of it. Because, See. I mean, uh, if, if this wasn't going on, I mean, we just found out about the Disney Plus stuff. Right. Who's going to be in those series? We got Marhershalali. I'm sorry, dude. I am never going to be able to get your name pronounced correctly. Um, still love you, but damn, I can't do that name. I keep tripping over it. Got him as Blade. Uh, you get all the other Marvel news, and until we get a trailer for the movie that's coming out in March, um, which I, is is Black Widow the one coming out in March, or is yeah, that May? Black Widow. Back, yeah, until we get a trailer, which we're still quite some ways off of, uh, how do we stay in the news? And so I, th I think part of this was a manufactured story. Could be. Uh, can I prove that? Hell no. <laughs> so, do, do we need to? Hell no. No, no, I don't. You know, just make of that what you wish. Um, Chicken salad. 
Mm, yummy. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, so the Spider-Man's back, just like he said he would be at the end of the movie. Spider-Man will return. I, I, although I will say that I preferred it when Bond did that. Because uh, the the classic, yes. In in the in the old the original Bond movies, James Bond will return in Goldfinger coming next summer. Meaning we're already filming it. Stay yeah. tuned. I liked that. We don't get that. Spider Man will be, will be back. I'm like, well, that's a bit vague. You know, he'll 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 be Spider Grandpa by the time he comes back from Sony. No, that's Spider Man will be back, and everybody knows he's Peter Parker. Oh snap! Not Thanos type snap because yeah, hang on a minute we're doing that again no <laughs> please don't it was traumatic enough the first time no, no. Um, i think if they had i think if sony had kept it i don't know that it would have done as good it wouldn't have been part of the mcu which i don't know if it would have qualified as a flop or not but i don't think it would have done as good as if they keep it in the mcu but that's my segue for the new segment we have that you came up with yesterday Brilliant segment. I, I segue. Mean, brilliant see, segue, not brilliant segment. Sorry. Brilliant segue. Thank you. Oh, it'll be a segment. A brilliant segment. I have not a segment, but I don't know that it's brilliant. because I don't have anything to go in this segment yet. <laughs> so this is all up to you. But it's Yay. called What a Brilliant Flop. I, I I suspect we're going you're going to be talking about movies that did not do so well financially, but are still really good. Yeah, I'm going to talk about movies that did not do so well financially or even with the critics. So the double whammy, because if a movie doesn't do well at the box office, but the critics like it, yeah, sometimes it's kind of hard to say that it was a flop because maybe their next project will will work out. These movies, critics didn't like them and the box office didn't like it, meaning the general the general populace that just didn't find a market. My first one is The Book of Henry. Book of Henry, and I don't have it right in front of me, but it's either with well, a 22 or 28 on Rotten Tomatoes. And again, Rotten Tomatoes, that doesn't mean it's a one-star movie. That's the consensus. The consensus is most critics didn't like it enough to say, go see it. Most critics said, don't see it, which is different from everybody said it stinks. There were some people who loved it, just not the many of them. Uh, the audience score on it, though, I think is like 58, something like that. So more than half the people, like I think there were seven of us, uh, that actually went to see it, liked it. Uh, the box office, since I mentioned it. <clears throat> Are you ready for this, Rob? $1.95. Just about. $1.5 million box office in the U.S. That's Ouch. Yeah, that's an ouch. Uh, the movie cost a little more than that to make, uh, obviously. So... That's the parameters around it. The story, and again, I really, really like this movie. It's a very strange movie, which is why it was off-putting to a lot of critics and to why people did basically stayed away in droves. This is about a young son. He's like 10 or 12, genius kid, absolute genius. Uh, <clears throat> he has a single mom who is just trying to get by struggling with life in general uh not so much struggling with how to raise her ch child but basically he's taken over all the adulting aspects you know he does their bookkeeping he makes sure he makes sure everything is done on time all that kind of stuff really fun portrayal the kids in this movie Jaden martell jacob tremblay they act like kids even though one of them is a genius he still acts like a kid which i love because too often People write roles for kids and they have a 30 year old in mind and this here's this kid doing it and it just doesn't work. It sucks. Not in this case. It's wonderful. The mom is played by Naomi Watts, wonderful actress, and she's wonderful in this. Life goes on. He gets interested in a girl who lives across the street. She's a little older than he is. She's like 15. He notices that dad is abusing his daughter. Not very cool. No. He works on a plot, on a plan to get rid of dad. So it's been this kind of lighthearted comedy drama slice of life thing. Then it get, takes this dark twist. It's like, oh my gosh, this is, they're going to have to deal with a sexual predator across the street. Fun fact, 
he's the police chief, so it's kind of hard to go to the police about him. Then, and this is why most critics were put off by this, Henry suddenly finds out, they find out Henry has a brain, I think it's a brain tumor. Henry's going to die. Whoa, that went really dark. We thought the sexual predator aspect was dark. Nope, it got even worse. And in the space of about mm, a couple really teary scenes, this is not a spoiler alert because if you don't know this, well, Henry's gone, okay? Mom and little brother are left to carry out Henry's plan to deal with this situation. And so it turns from this slice of life comedy drama, which is really, really good, to a really dark, almost like Silence of the Lambs level thriller. That's what put off so many people. Personally, I think it really worked because things happen in life. Sometimes you're having a great life and something horrible happens or something horrible happens to someone you know. This is a great, a great look at that. Is it a little far-fetched? Yep, it is. But <laughs> I just spent 15 minutes talking about Godzilla, King of the Monsters. So yeah, that's okay to explore far-fetched concepts in movies. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the movie. Great performances. Yes, it goes way, way out there on a limb with this. Uh, but it, it works. Uh, the director of this, <clears throat> Colin Trevorrow, you may know him from Jurassic World, wrote that. Uh, also writing an upcoming film later this year that we'll talk about, which will be a big, big picture. The mo first movie I saw that he did was um, Safety Not Guaranteed. He was a producer of that, which is an awesome, weird little sci-fi movie which I won't talk about in this segment because while it didn't make much money, critics loved it. So, but again, hardly anybody has seen this movie and it's really, really good. As long as you're prepared for something kind of out there and weird, but the performances are awesome. I really like the story. And again, yeah, there are some really weird, how on earth did that happen moments? But the portrayal of the kids is what, what this is centered on and they are so realistic and so well done really like it the book of henry again i would bet maybe two of you listening and that's assuming we have 10 million people listening have heard of this movie but you should totally watch this because this is a really really good film now available on youtube amazon prime google play itunes and voodoo Although I will recommend not getting it on Vudu because Vudu says it is fourteen ninety nine. I'm hoping that's a subscription price. Nah, it's been on sale. Uh, but it, yeah, it's three ninety nine everywhere else. But Vudu fourteen. I'm sorry. It, I'm hoping that's a subscription to Vudu is what I mean, not a subscription to the Book of Henry. Hmm? Uh, oh, and by the way, the, <clears throat> the the young lead who plays the genius kid, Jaden Martell. The kid who is really, really interesting in it, Bill, him. Ooh. So now you can make the connection because I know y'all have seen that movie. So, I mean, this kid is a really good actor and everybody in this is excellent. But uh, he's also in the kid and if you've seen St. Vincent, uh, not a flop. Did really well with critics. He's the kid in St. Vincent, the one with Bill Murray as the really creepy, not creepy, but really mean, irascible kind of neighbor who takes this kid under his wing. This kid is awesome. I mean, no matter, he could be in a George Lucas film and it would be good. So that's how good this kid is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, positive note, actually we've got three positive things again this week. Woo. What a concept. Maybe next week we'll review something that we thought was crap. No, <laughs> hopefully we'll find something else. We'll find other good things. So there's good things out there and we need to find them. And although, you know, to keep up with our, we watch movies so you don't have to slogan, maybe I'll sit through some kind of crap movie or something. There you go. Just for you, because I love you guys. Cause you listen to us and we'll be back hopefully next week. So we'll see you then. Have, have a good week and get out and go see a movie or something. Captain, we're losing power in the warp engines. I think we should be leaving now. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Uh, and on that unusually harmonious bombshell, it is time to end. I am very disappointed!
Man, we have a weird job. It's shameful, but uh, eh, it's a living. And like that, he's gone. Darn, that's the end.